Good morning, church. How are you doing this morning? Good. I don't know about you, but it is such a joy every single Sunday to gather and then to worship the Lord together. Uh, just even sitting and getting quiet in those moments and then hearing the other voices ring out for me as an encouragement uh, to me and to my soul. And so uh, thank you guys for being here. Uh, my name is Albert. I'm one of the pastors here. If this is your first time, welcome. We're so glad that you're able to join us on a Sunday morning and to study God's Word uh, with us. Uh, and speaking of God's Word, if you by chance do not have a copy this morning, just raise your hand and we'll have an usher bring you a copy. So if you do not have a copy of God's Word, we have one of these in the back for you. So just raise your hand. We'll make sure you get one. So with that being said, turn in your Bible to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, I'll start making my way there as well. And we're going to be looking at verse 14 through 18 together as we study God's word this morning. John chapter 1, verse 14 through 18. And as you guys make your way there, if you would be willing, stand with me for the reading of God's word. Uh, we stand every Sunday when we read God's word, not out of a religious practice. We do it because we acknowledge that these are the very words of God and we want to honor them and we want to bow before them uh, symbolically as we stand in reverence to them. So John chapter 1 verse 14 through 18. If you're there in your Bible, read along. We're going to be reading from the NASB version. And if you do not have that, you can follow along on the screens and we will read together. So John chapter 1 verse 14 through 18. Let's read God's word together, church. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory. Glory is of the only begotten from the father, full of grace and truth. John testified about him and cried out, saying, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. For of his fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. You can be seated. And as you are, join me in prayer. Father, we praise you today. We praise you for you are worthy to be praised. We acknowledge your holiness and we acknowledge your grandeur. We acknowledge your might. We acknowledge that uh, there is none like you. There is no one beside you. And we thank you for the fact that you would give us the opportunity to know you because of the work of your son, Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God. And it's to Him now that our eyes and our hearts turn to as we walk through the Gospel of John. And the specific passage we're coming to this morning, Father, is one that is so simple, but so profound. It's a passage that even the new believer can step into and be deeply enriched in and it's also a passage that the seasoned believer, one who's walked with Christ for 30, 40 years, can still be stretched in and still marvel in. And so we need your help this morning. I need your help. We all need your help, not only to understand the word, but to rightly apply it to our lives. So that we might be changed from one degree of glory to the next, that we might look like our Savior just a little bit more today. So Holy Spirit, we turn to you and we ask for your help. Help give us the ability to comprehend all that is here and to live in light of it. We love you, Lord. We thank you for the privilege of giving us today and giving us the opportunity to study your word. It's in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. I don't know if you heard the story of the little girl that was scared of the dark and after doing the normal bedtime routine that she, done, she did with her mom and her dad, uh, it was about 10 o'clock and she yelled out, which was pretty customary for her, uh, down the hallway. She yelled, Mom, Mom, can you turn the lights on? I'm scared of the dark. To which the mom, as she always replied, said, It's okay, honey. 
Uh, the Lord is with you. How would you like to hear that if you're a kid? She said, yeah, mom, I, I know that, but I want someone with skin on. <laughs> Jesus is God with skin on. As we come to the final verses of the prologue, which we've talked about is the first 18 verses in John chapter 1. Uh, if, the, if the gospel of John is a house, the prologue are the first 18 verses and the prologue is the porch to the house. And in this prologue, we get some of the great themes that we're going to find in this text. In this prologue, we're going to get introduced to some of the main uh, points of emphasis that we're going to see as we study and navigate the Gospel of John. But as we come to the final 18 or the final four verses, verse 14 through 18, John the Apostle is going to put before us the cherished teaching of the incarnation of Christ. The fact that Jesus took on human flesh and he dwelt among us. And as he does that this morning, we're going to see three divine realities that should radically change our lives. So let's turn to God's word and let's begin to walk through the text. Look with me at verse 14. John the apostle begins this last section of his prologue by saying, And the word became flesh. The word flesh, the, the Greek word sarx, is a term that refers to man's physical being or human nature. And so as John brings up the word or the term the word once again, the first time since in verse 1, he brings it back up to make clear the truth that he's been alluding to in the first 13 verses. And what's the truth? The truth is that the word became flesh. Jesus, the word without laying aside his divinity, without setting aside his deity, takes on human nature in an act far greater than our minds can comprehend. Jesus walked among us as one who was truly God and truly man. In theology, this is what we refer to as what? The hypostatic union. Big fancy term which simply means that in one person existed Full deity and full humanity in Christ, absent of sin. Hypostatic union. John the Apostle says that Jesus, the eternal word, took on human nature. And as he took on human nature, look at verse 14 with me again at the next phrase. He dwelt among us. He dwelt among us. Dwelt is a word that means to take up residence. Or we can put it this way, to pitch a tent. How many of you guys like to camp? Just put your hand up. We've got some campers in here. You guys are the ones that like to go out into the middle of nowhere with no toilet paper. With no, well, if true camping, living off the land, fishing and, and going for your food in the most natural way. So in your minds, you get a vivid picture of what this word means. It means to pitch a tent in a place that you normally don't reside. That's the idea here when we read, he dwelt among us. God the Son pitched a tent and dwelt among man for 33 years. The eternal Son of God came and set up shop. He took on flesh and took on human nature, absent of sin. And he lived amongst the very people he created. Now for the original readers, this language would have steered their imagination to think about what? the tabernacle, to think about the stories that they've heard, to think about the, the Pentateuch, the first five books in the Bible, to consider how God, after taking his people from captivity in Egypt, he brought them out into the wilderness and he gave them instructions to build a tabernacle. And he did it for what purpose? You remember what God told Moses? Exodus 25, 8, let them construct a sanctuary for me. Why? That I might dwell among them, that I might be in their presence. See, what John is telling us is that in a more vivid way, in a more impactful way, in a more profound way, God has dwelt among men again. And it was through the person of Jesus. The second member of the Trinity walked on the very soil that he breathed into existence. And it was on this soil and it was in this world 
that three divine realities were put before the eyes of men. We're going to see those three divine realities this morning. Point number one, the first divine reality that was cascade before the eyes of men when the person of the Son, the second person, the Son, Jesus, came and dwelt among men was what? Divine glory. Point number one, divine glory. Look at verse 14 with me once again. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. We saw. It means to observe. It means to be a spectator. It's the idea of intently looking at something that's unusual. It's marveling at something because of its beauty or its, its uniqueness. One commentator, Hendrickson, puts it this way. It describes the act of one who does not stare absent-mindedly, nor merely look, nor necessarily perceive comprehensively. On the contrary, this individual regards an object and reflects upon it. He scans it. He examines it with care. He studies it, viewing and considering it thoughtfully. John says, for those who were present when Jesus walked on the earth, as they gazed with amazement on his life, in his words, in his works, they saw the glory and the splendor of God. They saw the attributes of God on display. Whether it was the mountaintop moment of Jesus' glorious transfiguration, or it was the miracle at Cana where he turned water into wine, or it was the feeding of the 5,000 where he took two measly fish and five loaves and fed a myriad of people, or it was walking on water, or it was the fact that he never sinned. They beheld his glory in it all. And Jesus' glory, my friends, is a special glory. Why? It's because it's a shared glory with God the Father. Look at the next part of verse 14 with me. John the Apostle goes on to say, And we saw his glory. Glory is of the only begotten from the Father. Now, I don't know about you. I'm not walking around calling my, my kids the only begotten. So I don't know if anyone in here does that. So that, that's unique language for us, is it not? But for the original here, this word was crystal clear in meaning. It's a word that means unique, one of a kind. See, while all believers are children of God, if you've believed you're a child of God, what this text tells us is that Jesus was the son of God in a very unique way. Our sonship doesn't match Christ's sonship. He was the eternal son of God. He's unique in every right and in every way, in every form and in every fashion. And thus the glory of the father is the same glory that Jesus possesses. Because what do we see in John chapter one? In the beginning was the word. That's Christ, right? And the word was with God. So he was distinct from the father. But what also do we see? And the word was God. The divine Godhead, the triune Godhead, the Trinity, something again that goes beyond our understanding, goes beyond our comprehension, but is true because it's taught to us in the word. Jesus has a shared glory with the Father because he is of the same essence. He is divine. He is eternal. He is God. And John says, as they marveled at it, they saw a glory that was what? You see it there in verse 14? full of grace and truth. The glory of God, the glory of Christ is the, is the display of his majesty, the display of his splendor, the display of his attributes for eyes to see. But John, who's got a very specific purpose, if you remember John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31, he's saying, I'm putting these things before you so that you may what? I'm, let's try that again. I'm putting these things before you so that you may what? believe and that by believing you may have life in his name john has a very specific purpose and so he could have talked about all the attributes but he said what full of grace and truth and praise god for this because if it were not for grace and if it were not for truth guess what salvation would be impossible full means to be complete 
It's a quantity of space that is completely occupied. It's glory that is filled to the brim with grace and truth, John said. Grace being the unearned, unmerited favor of God given to man. And in this case, grace unto salvation and truth is that which is in accordance with salvation. God's plan, God's purpose, God's will on how he is to save and how he will save. And much like he did before, John the Apostle brings a witness to the stand. I mentioned this a couple weeks ago. He's going to keep bringing witness after witness after witness. After he makes these lofty claims about Christ, he's going to bring witnesses to the stand to corroborate what he's saying. And once again, like he did last week, he brings the Baptist, John the Baptist. But unlike he did last week, he actually quotes some of his words. Look at verse 15 with me. He brings the witness, John the Baptist, to corroborate his lofty claim about the glory of Christ. John chapter 1, verse 15. John testified about him and cried out. Now he quotes John the Baptist. This was he of whom I said, he who comes after me, speaking of Jesus, has a higher rank than I. Why? For he existed before me. John wants us to know that what he has just claimed about Jesus The word is not something he just made up. No, there's historicity to the person of Christ. Jesus is a prophetic fulfillment that God had promised hundreds and thousands of years before. And John the Baptist, again, was a marker of that prophetic fulfillment as the forerunner who would come before the Messiah. John, despite being the older cousin of Jesus, which many of us we may have not known that John was the older cousin of Jesus, despite him having a ministry that was longer than Jesus, which in the eyes of the people in that day would have given him preeminence and superiority, John was not confused about who was superior. He knew his cousin was superior. Why? Because he existed before him. He was the eternal God. So question for you this morning. Can you say this morning that Jesus is glorious to you? Ask yourself that question right now. Can you say that Jesus is glorious to you? John the Apostle said he beheld his glory and they saw Jesus' miracles, his life, his his words. They marveled. His glory was matchless. His glory was unparalleled. Have you beheld the glory of Christ this morning? Let me put it into a present tense. Are you beholding the glory of Christ? You may ask yourself, how? He lived amongst us. 2,000 years ago, I wasn't present. How do I behold his glory? It's in what? His word. How do you behold Christ's glory? You turn to the word. You open up the pages of scripture. You turn to the gospels and you see his magnificence. You see his splendor. You see his majesty and you just marvel at it and you behold his unparalleled glory. Ask yourself this question this morning. What or whom do you praise most? So we talk about this idea of beholding his glory. How do we get handles on that? This is the question to ask yourself. What or whom do you praise most? Is it sports? I don't know why we always go to the Cowboys, but whenever a pastor preaches, they always use the Cowboys as an illustration. So I'm sorry, Mike. Is it the Cowboys? Which, did they make the playoffs? Is it even playoff time? I don't even watch football, see? You're getting a window into my, I, I'd read books all day. Is it sports? Is it family? Is it entertainment? Is it career? Is it comfort? Is it possessions? What gets you most excited? What's the thing that gets your adrenaline going? What's the thing that gives you the most purpose in life? Is it other things or is it the glory of Christ? Is it Jesus himself? 
You see, as Calvin said, we are idol factories. Our hearts are constantly churning up new idols. Our, our hearts are constantly producing new things that displace Christ and diminish his glory. And we put other things in its place and in his place. See, the question we got to ask ourselves this morning, as John says, we beheld his glory. Is, am I beholding the glory of Christ in 2021? And if I'm not, it's time for me to repent and turn and to behold once again in a fresh manner. May I encourage you to behold his glory this morning. But not only did the incarnation put before the eyes of men and emblazon before the eyes of men the divine glory of God, point number two, it also brought and put before them divine grace. Divine grace. Look at verse 16 with me. For of his fullness, we have all received and grace upon grace. I don't know about you, but just even saying grace just sounds so good. Grace. The we in this verse is not just a reference to all those who were present during the life of Christ. The we in this verse is a reference to you and I and to everyone who has believed. The apostle says to all those who have believed, they have received something. And that something is what? Grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. Now the phrase grace upon grace has led to many different interpretations. And we could spend some time going through a lot of them, but I just want to put two before you this morning. The most popular interpretations, and then after doing that, I want to put before you the one I think best is in accordance with the scriptures. The first option would be to understand the phrase as it's translated in most modern versions of the Bible. For example, the NASB, the ESV, the NRSV, you read grace upon grace. If you have the CSB, which is the Christian Standard Bible, you read grace after grace. If you have the NLT, the New Living Translation, you read one gracious blessing after another. In this sense, grace upon grace is understood to mean the reception of unending grace. For those who go to the beach, one of the things that you marvel at is how a, a wave comes in and it crashes on the shore. And just as the water recedes, there's another wave to replace it. It's this picture of grace upon grace upon grace. It's to understand it as God's limitless grace given to his people. It's to not acknowledge that God's supply of grace is limitless and he will never run out. Just when you think you've reached the end and the limit of the grace that he'll dole out, he doles out more grace. Now, I don't know about you, but I am thankful that this is a true reality in the scriptures. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, as Jesus is quoted and Jesus' words to Paul are quoted Paul says, in referring to Christ and what he's told him, my grace is sufficient for you. Jesus has sufficient grace. But as I studied, I'm not quite convinced that this is the sense of what John is getting at right here. And my reason for that is twofold. So let me give those to you now. Number one, the word upon. Just circle that word. So grace upon, circle upon. The word upon is the word anti, and it can also be translated into instead of, instead of. So rather than understanding the phrase to mean an unending flow of grace, which is a true statement and praise God for that, what John could be saying if we were to understand the word as instead of rather than upon is the idea of replacing that it is one grace that replaced another grace. And I believe this is what he's wanting to communicate. And let me show you another reason why. Look at verse 17 with me. Verse 17. You got four right there. So he's connecting these two. He says, For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through who? Jesus Christ. The law from God that he gave to his people through Moses was an act of grace. Now, I know we don't think about that often because the law brings what? Condemnation. It brings an awareness of our sin. And it's not by the works of the law that any of us this morning can be saved. 
So we don't think of the law as a grace, but was not the law still a gift, an undeserved gift from God to the people of God? While the law was never meant to be a means of earning salvation, it was a gift that was meant to show people their need for salvation. It was a gift that was to point them to God as the only one who can save them as they rested upon his saving work and they rested upon the promised one to come. D.A. Carson put it this way, On the face of it then, it appears that grace and truth that came through Jesus Christ is what replaces the law. The law itself is understood to be an earlier display of grace. So the grace of the law given to reveal man's sin and given to, re, to, to, to work in them a heartbeat to cast themselves upon Christ was replaced when Jesus showed up on the scene is what I believe John is getting at right here. As Jesus stepped into this world, the grace of God was brought into high definition. While the law pointed to grace, Jesus brought the grace. As their eyes beheld Jesus, they saw grace and truth more clearly than they ever had before. You see, the Christian life is a life of grace, is it not? The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 10 says, But by the grace of God, I am what I am. But by the grace of God, in other words, absent of what I've done, absent of my work, absent of my effort, absent of my holiness, God in his grace has made me one of his and has used me. Ephesians 2.8, speaking of salvation, for it is by grace that you are saved through faith. It's by grace. The Christian life is a life of grace. And it was in Christ that we were made recipients of grace. Have you experienced the grace of God this morning? Have you experienced the grace of God this morning? Grace that comes in and radically transforms and takes a dead heart and gives it life. Have you experienced the grace of God this morning? See, Jesus displayed the divine grace of God. He made available the divine grace of God. And all you have to do is simply believe. But not only did the incarnation thrust before the eyes of men divine glory and divine grace. Point number three, let's end it here. It also bought and brought divine revelation. Divine revelation. Look at verse 18 with me. And I don't know if you guys have sensed it so far, but this is a loaded section of Scripture. The best expositors, you can never plummet to the depths of what's found here. There's a lot here, but verse 18 No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he being Jesus, has explained him. Now first, understandably so, no one has seen God at any time. Why? Because the scriptures attest that God is what? He's invisible. One of my favorite passages to talk with Mormons about is 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 17 because in it, We read, now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible. God does not have a body. The only God be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul, as he writes to the church at Colossae, says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Jesus, in his conversation with the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, verse 24 He says, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in what? Spirit and in truth. So, of course, God cannot be seen because he's invisible. Now, some of you may be wondering, what about Moses? I feel like Moses had a moment where he saw God. I feel like reading through the Bible reading plan, I I came across Exodus and I'm pretty sure he saw God. Well, what happened? Remember what happened? What did God tell Moses? Exodus 33, verse 20 says, you cannot see my face. In other words, my essence. Why? For no man can see me in what? Live. 
So no one can see God because one, God is invisible, but two, if God were to really show you his essence and his glory, you would fall flat and die right on the spot. But that's what makes the next statement so jarring. Look at what he says in verse 18. He says, the only begotten God, again, like verse 14, this is a reference to Jesus as the unique son of God. And then listen to what he says, who is in the bosom of the father. If you have an ESV version, that reads at the father's side. NIV, in its closest relationship with the father. The new revised standard version, close to the father's heart. This idea of intimacy. So this only begotten God, Jesus, who's in the closest relationship with the father, Look at this last phrase. He has explained him. It's where we get our word exegete. You often have heard people say that. Exegesis, to make clear the text. The son has revealed and made clear who the father is. It's this truth that allows Jesus in John 14, 9 to say, He who has seen me has seen the father. You see, when we talk about beholding the glory of Christ and we work through the pages of Scripture and we go through the Gospels, when we see Jesus, we see God's love as he wept at the grave of Lazarus. When we see Jesus, we see God's love for children as Jesus embraced them. When we see Jesus, we see that he is not a respecter of person. God is not a respecter of person as he called disciples to himself that in the eyes of other men, We're not worthy. In Jesus, we see God's power as he fed 5,000 plus men with two loaves or five loaves and two fish. Jesus explains the father. Do you want to know what God is like? Stare at Christ. Open up the gospels. Look at the pages of scriptures. Marvel at this high definition view of your creator. It was an article in Moody Monthly that Frank Fairchild uh, wrote about the story of a a pristine painting on the the top of a Roman palace. And as he writes about the story, he goes on to share how most of the visitors, as they as they came in, they were they were unable to to really to marvel as as, in the manner that they were 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 supposed to, because as they looked up at the high ceiling, their necks would begin to, to hurt and be in pain. And so they would never be able to stop long enough to marvel at its beauty. And he goes on to share the story how someone came up with the idea of putting mirrors on the floor so that as the visitors came in, they just simply stopped and they were able to, because of the reflection, marvel at what was on the ceiling. And listen to what Fairchild writes. He says, Jesus does precisely that for us when we try to get some notion of God. He interprets God to our dual hearts In him, God becomes visible and intelligible to us. We cannot by any amount of searching find out God. The more we try, the more we are bewildered. Then Jesus appeared. He is God stooping down to our level and he enables our feeble thoughts to get some real hold on God himself. Do you want greater clarity and a greater knowledge and a greater understanding of God? Look at Christ. Marvel at Christ. And behold his glory and his splendor. If you have yet to meet Christ this morning, he's a wonderful savior. He's a beautiful savior. He's a powerful savior. And he's a loving savior. If you have yet to meet him this morning, run to him now. His arms are still open wide. His arms are still ready to embrace. His arms are still ready to wrap around you at this moment. And all you have to do is believe. Believe that he died in your place. Believe that he went into the grave. And three days later, he came forth in resurrection. 
believe that he is the eternal son of God and that in him, as he was the one man with the perfect divine nature and a human nature in one person, his divine nature was enough to satisfy the just wrath of God that was meant for you. In his human nature, he was tempted and tried in every way as we are, yet without sin, so that he could be a perfect high priest and he can render an adequate sacrifice. Believe in him today. And if you have already, praise God. We're going to sing another song. And as we sing this song, marvel at the beauty of Christ. Allow your heart, just like your car after it's been through a bunch of dirt and, and, and grime and muck, to be washed clean. Allow your eyes to be washed clean this morning. Your heart to be scrubbed clean this morning from the idolatrous things that so easily weigh us down. And allow it to be fixed once again and anchored once again onto the glorious Savior, Jesus. He's worthy. He's worthy. The more we live through this life, my friends, the more we will see again and again and again that the things that this world promise us to fulfill us will always fall short. But he won't. He never has and he never will. He's glorious. Jesus, you are glorious. And as you came, you displayed before the eyes of man and you still display before our eyes as we study your word, your glory and your grace. And you make known the Father to us. You are worthy to be praised. And that's exactly what we want to do now. We want to praise you. We want to lift high your name. We want to worship you. And we also want to be transformed so that not just today we do that, but tomorrow and then Tuesday on into next Sunday. Scrub our hearts clean of the filth of this world, O oh God. Give us a greater eyesight to behold the beauty of the Son. He is worthy. Jesus, you are worthy. We love you, Lord. We thank you. It's in, all, it's in Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, amen. amen.